The following is a long format chat with Ilya Jean Perez. Recruitment Associate at the Maritime Industry Platform, Shipster, and Summer Associate at the Alliance for Financial Inclusion in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I enjoy very much to learn how Ila developed her government skills through her time at the Office of Studios in the Philippines and how her current planning experience is reflected in the gender financial inclusion project that she is involved across Southeast Asia. This is on the Long with FBR podcast. If you like this episode, feel free to support it on the details below in the description. And now, your feature presentation. Three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of On the Long with FBR. Today we have Hila. Hi. Thanks for doing this. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It has been a long overview, um, I think, recording. We planned this during MIT and then we had to postpone. I'm sorry for that, but at least now. And then when we came back, or when I came back, um, we had to postpone once and then at least for the third time, it's the charm. Absolutely. <laughs> so we finally got the opportunity to, to discuss in this marvelous place uh, that happens to be in property of Bang Negara. Exactly. It's very windy uh, now um, compared earlier to the hot, but at least now we get a good weather. That's right. So we have been uh, trying to discuss uh, like locations and everything, but uh, we realized that what if we get an opportunity to, to showcase the building? And Besides the academic building, most of you will also see something that is like a like a Nokia building, looks like a Nokia cell phone, <laughs> and other buildings around here, the city of Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. So, in the beginning, it started like what was with the uh, MIT trip, but there was a lot of things to remember. Which was the highlight that you remember the most from the time in Cambridge, Massachusetts? Um, I think. Basically, just stepping in the United States for me. Um, it, it was my first time, and so I think that's already a highlight. That's something for me. It's um, a dream once that I, I always wanted. I was supposed to be part of an exchange program when I was in high school, but it was during that time also that there was like a lot of things happening in terms of, you know, terrorism, and they were a bit um, adamant because it was also the time where there was a lot of like I don't know if you heard about the Abu Sayyaf youths in the Philippines mm. so um, I think okay. there was like some concerns in terms of processing my papers that time so what happened was that the exchange program got delayed, got postponed and then eventually it happened but I was already going to graduate so it wouldn't make sense for me to come to the US because it's supposed to be a junior exchange program so it should, should be a junior high school program so that in itself for me was a highlight. It's like a long delay, like delayed gratification in a way. Um, but yeah, that being in the United States is already a highlight. And then coming to MIT, of course, learning from those professors. Um, I've never imagined being like part of a program um, in terms of learning from good professors, not just the awarded ones, but well-respected and very humble, um, I'd say. And of course, being with a cohort in general, very diverse, and we come from different backgrounds, different professions. So those, I think, were the highlights of everything that you mentioned or you asked. It's true, because it was like a long overdue to go there. And also, I have to say that we were lucky eh, because the, yes. the weather itself was not as bad as yes. other people. Like, and we came at the right time, spring, um, supposed to be, should be spring, right? Um, based from what, or how they oriented us people. So I think we were a very lucky batch. That's right. And uh, we also got a chance to see like, uh, how expensive things really were <laughs> compared to what we see in the news. Like, uh, we couldn't uh, remember, like, wait a second, a sandwich costs $5? Why is $5? And it's not a big sandwich, it's a small sandwich. <laughs> Oh, but you know, um, I just ha have to share this because I was traveling with Rose and Ash. Um, when we were in New York, it was very different. The okay. serving was really big. So in all the places that we went into, we just had to share. Mm. But yeah, you're correct. In Boston, it was different. There were some places that had a big share, like for sharing, like big serving. But 
there was actually some places which were really just right that would actually be just for one person. Mm. That's yes, cool. it is quite expensive. <laughs> so about expensive, and, and you say you were already in New York. Which was the most expensive place? Um, well, I don't know if you have heard about this, but our adventure in New York was really mostly about walking. Ah. <laughs> we walked a lot. That's why we saved a lot of costs in transportation. So we took Uber, of course, in the beginning, but going to different touristy spots or destinations, we were actually walking. We hit even like, for there was one day we hit about 25 to 30,000 steps. Wow. And we went from the Upper East Side, going to, you know, where our hotel was. We've wow. been just crossing, crossing and walking all across New York. Even Ash and Rose, we were so surprised about ourselves that we really did that. Because in Malaysia, we don't walk that much. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do walk around here, but not taking 25,000 to 30,000 steps. In one day? In one day, imagine. Wow. <laughs> so that's what we did. So I think the most expensive one would be just going to, we, we bought a ticket to the Summit One. It's a, like a Vanderbilt building. Mm -hmm. And it was very cool because it's like transporting yourself to a very, um, I think it's kind of a combination of a sci-fi movie uh -huh. and also they did state-of-the-art, um, I think, architecture. There was one place where in, you're in a certain floor and then you see your image like reflecting on the floor but you also see your image reflecting on top. So it's like, uh -huh. a, I, I was just like, oh, I, I feel like I'm three people both at like different floors, you know? <laughs> And, that's, that's really cool. That's yeah, really it's cool. very cool. And there was one uh, floor I can remember where we just walked in. Um, it was very dark, so it felt like I was like in a galaxy or like it's very pitch black. Ah. And then there's like a camera that's flashing on you. And then when they took a photo of you, basically they take a photo of you, you come to across a room and there's like clouds, and then you see a reflection of your face mm. like on the clouds. Like, wow. And it's like flash in a big screen. So it's like mind-blowing. <laughs> that's impressive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we took like an elevator that's basically in the same thing that I think I don't think if you've seen like a lot of you know movies about Mars and all that buildings about when NASA is like an astronaut comes in and there's like red lights right flashing in. And I remember the elevator is like that. There's this sound of like you're being transported to a different Ah, that was really <laughs> nice. Like all of a sudden you are like in a video game or in a science Yeah, movie. exactly, exactly. And I don't know how or when I had will ever be experienced or that that same thing, but yeah, it was very mind blowing. Yes, that's true. Uh, we got the opportunity to also get some of that uh, New York feeling. Uh, we were with Najesha, Asel, Gaukar, and oh, yeah, one of our I friends. Oh yeah, I saw your video. Yeah, your photos. So we literally had to escape Hudson Yards because <laughs> it was too much. <laughs> We got the opportunity to walk around and then trying to get the freebies that the town has and then all of a sudden you realize that oh Rockefeller uh, Center has like uh, you have to pay to go there and it's like mm. no maybe no, no. let's go other place. We went to the Roosevelt Island mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which was nice and then we went to Chelsea to get some food which was like the um, typical lobster roll or yeah. something else and then we went walking to, from the Chelsea station towards Hudson Yards which was like uh -huh. a lot of people, buildings were bigger. Yeah. We saw the famous uh, honeycomb, mm -hmm. which was closed because oh, yeah. a lot of people wanted to go there to go up, but they mm -hmm. couldn't even go to the second yep. because they saw on the news, ah, there was uh, one guy who jumped yeah, that's and made the first. The same in our experience. We weren't able to go there and we were just taking the photo outside of the building because was the sense, right? Because mm -hmm. you're not allowed to go up because someone like took their life. And just outside that place, there was a famous X, which is like a big tall building. They want to sell you the experience that you are there, uh, like almost with only glass, and then there is the emptiness. But it was like $40 the ticket, and it was like, uh, we can go to other place, uh, maybe to see the moonlight, because it was supposed to be like a red moon going on that Sunday night. And we went to a Mexican cantina rooftop, which was a it was fine, but the prices were a little low, uh, over the top, for example. Uh, one taco is one dollar. One taco is one dollar. And they were selling 
three tacos for twenty dollars. Like, wow. what is going on? <laughs> Why are you stealing to me? Like, I mean, it's not gonna happen. What's the explanation behind that? I'm so curious. Like, that's a good point. I also want to come across because uh, it's either, like price discrimination happening yeah, here, right? Some about price discrimination and also something about uh, um, paying for the experience. Okay. Because the one dollar taco in context will be like <laughs> you will go to those uh, food trucks and you get it and you're on your own. Yeah, you are in the middle exactly, of the street. Exactly. And that place was literally in a rooftop and we ah, actually were. There's like a good ambience. That's like that's the point. Maybe the intangible that was reflected on the price was. So there was like a positive externality. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I'm glad you you came across with that uh, to represent what was going on. So a lot of externalities were already into the price from so many places that we went. Like all of a sudden, the typical Starbucks that was like one dollar or two dollars, well, those doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Now they are like five or ten dollars. But yes, that happened. And going back to the experience from how expensive or how singular it was to uh, the Cambridge experience. I have to reflect also that the classes were good. System dynamics, I have to say, was uh, mm. a knowledge that mm -hmm. you don't find it everywhere. Yeah, exactly. It's very niche in a way. Um, I do remember having to do system dynamics at work um, when I was still in government. Just because we did a lot of those log frame, we did a lot of like the fishbone analysis, you know, all of the frameworks. But the system um, dynamics class just put it into perspective for me um, and there's like a lot of things that I've learned like terminologies concepts that I never knew there was like something like this like a course for this uh -huh. it was something like when you go to work during the time when I was doing a lot of project management and m and like monitoring and like evaluation projects you have to do all these frameworks but it's just because you attended a workshop right and it's mm -hmm. just like a two-day workshop where they teach you and you have to absorb it <laughs> but this one you have to take the whole course and there's even like a long like semester that you can dedicate just to learn all of this so there's more to it right mm -hmm. so i think that's you're very correct but i do um have to be honest I'm, I'm very honest about the experience the system dynamics for quite like for the past two weeks it was really tiring at the end you know um, it really drains you um, i don't know how about you but for me like the first five days okay but then coming to doing some of the other exercises it was really like to a point where oh my god i am thinking about all these loops because there's, there's so many things that you can actually do right mm -hmm. there's so many cross loops positive and there's already reinforcing there's already balancing loops. but you really have to go through the nitty gritty and find the base root of the problem so when i was doing that in my work that's also the same thing that i've experienced so talking about here ila the student you also introduced right now to the audience ila from government yeah <laughs> so how is that uh, from government and you reflect about the, oh, uh, that okay. experience um, so I was part of the Ministry of Tourism in the Philippines um, so I worked there for almost five years and coming into working for the government it was really a plan um, um, I'd say most of the decisions I make in life are just the ones laid in front of me or what presents itself immediately I'm one to not in in terms of like my background I do have an urban planning background and I like planning but I've never practiced planning for myself like I usually go with what is presented with me and weigh all my options from there so I never knew that I'll be stepping into government because my background was of course um, I took political economy and after that I worked for a research think tank so basically I was just happy doing that junior analysts were writing for this publication from Oxford Business School and I was just you know in my comfort zone I was writing I was doing something related to my course and I was traveling with my boss we usually meet with you know high profile people I did tourism um, the tourism aspect of that macro publishing like macro book macroeconomic books and I also did the healthcare and I think another angle that I was looking into, which it was last minute, was to do the um, sustainability aspect, which uh -huh. somehow um, led me to doing all of the things after, you know, tourism. I worked for the tourism government, um, and then I went to the um, sustainability aspect when I entered urban planning. 
and then healthcare is currently I think close to my heart because most of my family members and relatives and even my boyfriend is from the healthcare industry so somehow it's just aligned um, I don't know and coming back to the question of the government so I entered there way back in 2016 so it was like a from the Pinoy administration transitioning to the Duterte administration ah. so I came back in very uh, I came in in a very interesting like a change is coming, right? It was like a like the motto of the Duterte administration. So I came during that time and I was this quite ideal person that time. I, I think I feel like I was working for one of the deputy ministers, so it's quite a higher official. Um, so next to the minister. So I was under the planning department and that's where my love for planning came about. And we were doing a lot of projects, particularly with um, World Bank and Asian Development Bank in the tourism industry. One was about skills upgrading for tourism workers because you have to streamline at the same time, address the industry gap. Because most of the time, the ones that are taught in the universities does not really address the skills that is needed in the yeah. industry. Okay. So there was need for her call to improve that. So it was very far from what is being taught in the university and what is needed in the hospitality sector. And as you know, the hospitality sector like services industry relies heavily on skills. And there was one aspect to uh, the other project that I worked with or worked on is the infrastructure. So we had a convergence program. It was the very first program in terms of converging three different government agencies. Um, Time out. Three government agencies? Yes. That sounds difficult. Yes, it is. Uh -huh. But the interesting part is it worked out. Mm. And it was the first one. In, uh, like across different um, units um, within government, for the first time ever, it's like a rare thing, right? That government agencies talk to each other to really build something. So that was the pilot. Um, it was the Department of Tourism, the Department of Public Works and Highways, and you have the, the, the pub, uh, Department of Transportation. And the idea was to create tourism roads leading to tourist destinations. And the role is that, of course, tourism comes in because we are the ones identifying which destinations are already ready for the market. Oh. And then the public works and highways would be the ones in charge of doing the roads or, or building the roads, right? But of course, the transportation is quite important because everything, when you create the tourism circuit where you place your um, attractions, where you place your destinations, where you place um, areas where tourists can eat and all of the aspects of having a full tourism experience, you would have to consider your port of entry, which is why transportation should be involved because there involves the airport or mm -hmm. if it's like a, the Philippines, you have a lot of seaports because you have about 7,641 yeah. islands. There's a lot of islands as well. Yes. Many, many of those. So, so that's the journey. Um, <laughs> it's, really it's like a long-winded answer. But and it yeah. has to be because, wow, so many, not only planning, but also government and also kind of government dynamics. Yeah. If you want to put the two things together. Yep. That's, that's impressive. And also something else that uh, you entered in, in a time that there was a change in the government, but you as a, a skilled professional, we're, we're protected, like, hey, we, we need these people here because they are going to be doing the work. Mm -hmm. Which is, it speaks volumes to what is going on right now. I saw a lot of uh, new companies, like, they send the offer and they receive the offer. Mm -hmm. Or they are doing massive layoffs all of the sudden, mm -hmm. finding uh, excuses. But here it's like, hey, you are about to start, we don't care who is in the top. We need yeah. to keep working. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, you mentioned Philippines at least five times during your <laughs> answer. So, what is Philippines? Because uh, I, I, I want to understand a little more. Okay. And many people who may be watching this want also to see uh, what, what is Philippines? Like, where, where is that? Or how is the weather? Okay, so, well, we're currently in Malaysia, right? So, the Philippines is one of the neighboring countries of Malaysia. It's part of the ASEAN region. 10 countries, members of ASEAN, the Philippines is one of them. And as you know, we're called the Pearl of the Orient. There's so much in the history, we've been occupied by the Spanish for about 300 years. Oh, those guys again? <laughs> yes. Man, it's always Spanish. <laughs> yeah, in search for spices, 
we landed up getting a religion, which is Christianity. And then I think we, I mean, we were also occupied by the Americans. And it's very much evident. Um, our education system is quite close or similar to how the American education system is. And that's why we put um, a big priority in public schools, for example. We invest a lot in public schools. And um, we we're also occupied for quite a bit by the Japanese. I, for one, I have roots. My, my um, great-grandfather was maybe a Japanese um, soldier who uh, stayed in the Philippines and retired there and met a Filipina woman and got married. So mm. that's why my mother's uh, middle name is uh, of Japanese um, descent. Like, you, you probably know it definitely. I share it so yeah so that's probably the, the story um, of, of how the Philippines is and of course we're a mix of a different culture um, melting pot as you'd say we have um, I think uh, based on my history if I remember it correctly we have a lot of like ethnic um, uh, different ethnic people so I do remember have Malays coming into Philippines for quite some time earlier before we have also the Indones that's they call it and we also have um, the Negritos, or what we call the ones that I think most of them are now based in northern Luzon. Um, some are still in other parts of, of the Philippines, but yeah. And we have, of course, three major, um, well, as you know, Luzon, Zayas, and Mindanao, 7,641 islands. Mm -hmm. and, and it varies because there's low tide and high tide. So mm. some of the islands get lost during, but of course, we, they've already counted it in general um, and then we're also the food in terms of food in terms of culture it's similar to Malaysia actually mm. that's why I felt it's just being at home in here because we also like spicy food we also like Chinese food we do appreciate rice <laughs> we love rice mm. and we like a lot of saucy a lot of spices in our food um, we also practice well some similarities in the language um, I do know there's like a, some languages in Malaysia and the Indonesia region which are quite the same. Um, and also I think what's very much interesting is, well, we're very much a consumer-driven economy aside from the fact that we rely heavily on our overseas Philippine workers. Mm -hmm. So that's why um, I think majority of the Philippines are in terms of the Philippines growth is, can, can be very much attributed to the services industry or, or also to the um, overseas Philippine workers with foreign remittances. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very much in, in like a summary of what I can say about the Philippines. And we're very, as a, as a like a culture or like people, you'd say we're very hospitable. We're very welcoming. That's why tourism is one of the main drivers in the economy. People in general, when you go to the Philippines, you'd probably, I'd say this with, with confidence, probably feel welcome wherever you go. Um, it's seldom that people won't really help you. It's very, it's very rare that, especially for if we have foreigners, we usually treat them as our own, invite them to our big celebrations. We like, we also do the whole banana leaf thing, ah. like a poodle fight. We eat together. That's cool. So we do those. That's why we share a lot with the Malaysian, Indonesian, and other ASEAN regions in terms of practices, culture. So yeah. that's really fantastic, and. It also shows like how things can be so so parallel yeah. because when you are in different parts of the place, all of a sudden like oh I miss home. And it's like, mm. No, you're not supposed to miss home. You're <laughs> supposed to be an adult on your own. And it's like well, I don't have to miss so much because it feels it feels familiar. Yeah, it's ex exactly my sentiments at times. <laughs> yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And. It's, it's just uh, remarkable uh, that uh, a, a lot of people that, that we met, uh, they have their own stories. And now you're building a new story. Mm -hmm. Because right now it's, uh, it's June, and I guess uh, it's safe to say that you have been working something out, right? Mm. Tell us about your current endeavors at AFI. Okay, um, so I am working at AFI as a summer associate, and I'm under the gender finance. Uh, Finance unit. Um, so what I'm doing is basically helping them streamline their processes. It's more of an internal management, organizational change. Um, that's really what I wanted to be put in. Um, coming into an MBA, I have no experience in business at all, except for because I'm 
part-time real estate broker in the Philippines. That's basically which is sales on sales. But um, and also I think the marketing side probably because I work in the tourism industry, so I've been very much in doing a lot of campaigns. I've been working with the marketing arm of um, the government, but it's really different, you know. That's why when I decided to come in to getting my MBA degree, I wasn't really sure which one would I really want to. But I have this knack for doing processes, doing a lot of anything related to streamlining or making things more efficient. Um, that's probably because of my role as well when I was working for the government. And I also have this thing on human resource. Like I, I do love speaking to people and talking to people. And I mean, thinking about ways and how to improve because um, I come from an, a, well, my background in the government. It, I, I don't know if probably it's the same for other countries, but for us, there's a lot of issues in terms of how human resources is at government because there's very little incentive. But at the same time, you're very overworked. Oh. And um, in terms of salary, you know, uh, um, it's very different if you're a rank and file versus if you're, of course, a higher official. Usually, if you're in those high positions, you get a lot of things, you get a lot of benefits, you get a lot of, uh, in a way, not really perks, but also um, in a way to award you or incentivize you to perform better. But if you're in a rank and file, it's very different. But most of the time, I mean, of course, the decision makers are important, but how about the rank and file employees? They've been there most of their life, and they have a security of tenure. That's one incentive for them. But where's the career progression? Where are they going after a long time? That's why you kind of see people having to. I think I don't know if you've encountered, but there are a lot of people who seem to be very um, angry at you for for like if you're doing a lot of permits when you're processing permits. I don't know if you encountered. There has been like some issues with government um, people being not too accommodating, mm. not really serving as what they said, you should be serving the public, but it's like they're not really happy seeing you. They don't feel very incentivized or because the pay that they're getting is really not at par with how the industry should be like in terms of like if you're in a corporate setup, right? But you get to know them and then you read their CV. Some of them really have like a background in like a master's degree, but they haven't been able to get a promotion. They've been stuck in the same work for about 10, 15 years, doing the same thing over and over again. And there's nothing done about it. So I think all of those things, that's what um, pushed me to just go explore an MBA. Um, I wanted to look into organizational development, something about change management. And it's a different setup, yes, working for like a pub private versus a public sector. There's m much that I should learn. But I think I just wanted to see how corporations do it or how organizations do it. And for for example, with my project with Afi, to put back to your question, it's quite the same. Um, they've been around for quite a number of years already. And this gender inclusive finance unit has been around since 2018. What's very nice, I think, in my project, it was like an um, internal um, arrangement in the sense that they really pushed for it. Um, not every organization will realize, oh, our SOPs are really in a mess, or they wouldn't even evaluate themselves and think of, oh, we should be working on this, right? Um, make, 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 ensuring that processes are good so that other units will be working with us efficiently. Not everyone has that self-awareness or reflective state wherein they want to change something within their, their unit or within their organization. Most of the time, as long as you're working, you're hitting your targets, you're doing what you, your goals are or your KPIs, you're okay. But I like the project because it was like a, something that the unit recognized is lacking within them. And they wanted to improve and they wanted me to come in to help them. And so I've been talking to all units across AFI and even external partners with what they think should be happening for this unit to function well and for them to be more efficient in what they do so they can be able not just to reach their KPIs but at the same time to provide quality service because at the end of the day, they're funded um, and they have all this backing or like all this arrangements with the central banks and their member-led institution within a developing country and they're providing service. So they should be doing the best of what are quality service as you can say. That's very important because uh, the motivation of a person, even if you keep it a uh, constant, it requires lo a lot of energy to stay at that level. Yeah, exactly. And 
especially right now when a lot of people are literally fighting for jobs uh, and that's one thing because how can you put five years into a job that is not going to give you the same motivation but also when you mention about the, the gender inclusive uh, uh, project it is relevant really relevant uh, like people may say well you have to support the narrative because you're a woman but hey if i am a man i have like 50 percent chance to have a, a kid either a daughter or a or a, or a boy mm -hmm. so i want also to have uh, the opportunity for them to win exactly that's really nice of you to say because usually co the conversation about gender is you know um women are not given the um, opportunities or probably women are not being given the right proper treatment but i don't think it's supposed to be just within or amongst women groups but also men should be involved in the conversation mm -hmm. Because I think for it to work, for, for more people to be aware of these kinds of issues, you need the side of men as well, right? You need their opinion, their thoughts, and you have to put them inside the conversation so that they're aware. Because some probably are not that, you know, they live in their own bubble, probably, or they're not too much aware of what is happening around them. That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. So if you involve them, then the same thought that you've mentioned, then whenever they have kids, they also feel like, oh, if I have a daughter, right, I also want her to enjoy certain the same opportunities as what my son enjoys. Mm -hmm. And also, something that is going on right now, some people already saw in the news, like, uh, how do you feel like there are men that call themselves women and competing in swimming uh, uh, contests? It's like, Wait a second. Uh, men are supposed to compete with men. Women are supposed to mm -hmm. compete with women. And the people who are doing this, they are supposed to compete among themselves to make things more equitable. Yes. Because what happens is, like, if men are not stepping in to help women, all of a sudden you have a narrative that these people who are competing against women will start to erase the competition. And nobody wants that because that's not fair. That's that it's not the spirit of competition itself. So going again to what is uh, the the financial inclusion, I have also to say that uh, there is not so many women who have so many opportunities to open a banking account exactly. or do the transfers or like somebody who choose to born in a, in a sanctioned country. I have to say the quote, choose to burn in a sanctioned country because that's how all the regulators think about mm. it. And they, they cannot move the money because yes. of uh, codes or things. Or that like cultural and societal norms, right? Yeah. And it's like, where are the options? Mm -hmm. Where are the options for them? Or, uh, for example, Islamic uh, fintech. Mm. Uh, gender inclusion for Islamic fintech is also big because yes. a lot of women who have their businesses they want, and they happen to be Muslim, they would like to find their option that is complying with the Sharia law. Mm. So everybody is in good agreement. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's very much the same as what you highlighted or some of the projects of the unit as well um, with their members. And also you have to understand, like as a woman, um, there are some areas such as, I remember uh, one of our uh, heads in that unit explained, um, Helen, she said, for example, in Solomon Islands, um, you have to travel for two days just to open your bank account. Mm -hmm. For a woman, her time is very much precious because aside from working, she's also a, a, the mother of kids at home. And traveling just to open a bank account for two days, like it's not really feasible, right? Because she has to manage which are her priorities. Mm -hmm. And if you don't provide the opportunity for that woman to actually get that, to open just a simple bank account, then what are you doing as well? It's not really like the woman is incapable. It's more of you don't provide opportunities for the women to get access to these opportunities. Like these things that are super simple, super basic, or should be very much there to begin with. And yeah, um, I think those are the kinds of the projects that they really worked on and are trying to address it. That's also another point that, that we would love to discuss is like, how is that in 2022? With the advent of internet, you still have to travel two days yes, to do it in paper. <laughs> what is going on? Like, who who is this design made for? To what kind of people you really want to exclude? Mm -hmm. 
and also for, for a woman to travel sometimes can be alone. Mm -hmm. It can be uh, a danger itself. Yeah. But going back to financial inclusion, that's what I saw in Southeast Asia, and I would like to discuss also in this with you, the digital banking. We happen to see that there is a places in Hong Kong, in Singapore, and now in Malaysia that they are opening the digital banking license, so more and more people can get access to these uh, uh, financial products. So, happens to be aspirational. The better question is how they can not only provide uh, access to finance for people, but also responsible finance. Because I have to say, sometimes when I was younger, opening a bank account, ah, I have this bank account, <laughs> but then I cannot maintain it because it's too expensive or I don't know how to use it. I was using a saving account, like a checking account, defeating the purpose itself, and I had to close it because I cannot keep it, let alone if I have a, a disposable income to invest, and it's like supposed to be your disposable income, not your whole life savings into investing. Mm. So even that financial e e education is part of the Awareness, financial Awareness, right? Yeah. Literacy. Um, it's nice that you point that out because in the Philippines, I don't know, um, it's something that I think a lot of my friends, especially um, those that I know who are working in the financial services sector, um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we're also one of those countries that there's a lot or a majority of the population who have no access to such financial um, services, they don't have bank accounts, one. Okay. Um, a lot of our population still have no insurances in place. Okay. And that concept of financial literacy is never taught anywhere since your primary until your college years, unless you have like, of course, your parents taught you or you have subjects or you, you're well educated. But for most of the population, you're not quite aware. And that's why when, as you've mentioned, there's a lot of um, advent of technology and coming in of like digital banks, we have this major e-wallet and um, company that we call Gcash. Um, it's actually one of the, I think right now, they're getting about 40 million users in the country because... Time out. You say 40 million users. Yep. Yep. In context. USA is 350 million people, Canada is 35 million people. So you're saying that that app has more users than the whole country of Canada. <laughs> wow. They actually have a lot already um, because it's very easy to open. As you mentioned, it's a digital bank. What they require is that you're of a certain age, of course. Um, I think they have a GCash now even for students, that's the thing. So they have one thing for like um, Grab and also all the other things, their other like digital banks. Um, and they have about, I think for students and also for adults. So it's for 16 years old and 18 years old and above. That's why they had, they were able to get about 40 million users. So I think that in itself helped in getting more um, people to come in. And what they only require when you open is the um, copy of an ID, a valid ID, and of course, you know, have to sign in your relevant information. And I think for the sources of fund, they're not too strict because they have a student account. So that's why. And you can also link it, link, link it in with your other savings account. They partnered with banks. Oh, okay. So they partnered with banks. So that's why your savings account can already be linked in. Hmm. So I see the value in the partnership. That's very important. Yeah, because usually when we discuss these uh, financial services uh, products and it's about to reach users, but not only normal users, but active users, mm -hmm. partnerships is a big game. Mm -hmm. And they partner with educational institutions as well. Because I remember my brother, when he was still in college, I mean, actually junior college, because now they have like, we have a K-12 already in education system, so they call something like a junior college level. Um, they partnered with his school just to give them a GCash account because ah. some of their, um, I think, incentives for like certain prices at school will be sent because it was during the pandemic, right? It was just easier to transfer money digitally rather than ask the student to come into school and sign a paper and give the money. Mm. So they also did that. That's good. That's really good. Yeah, so 
So the partnerships, as you are very correct, it's very important. And they're very strategic, and that's really nice. That's why I think they got this whole, uh, I think, 40 million users. Yeah. We have about, I think, 100 plus million in the Philippines in terms of population. I mean, to get in, you have to get in young, and it's like educational uh, perspective. Open your account. And the value of money is in the time. So the early you invest, the early you put your money, just keep it there. Mm -hmm. And it's like, instead of uh, buying a, a soft drink that you don't need because you already have a cup of water on your hands, like, just save it there. Yeah, and they actually use it, I mean, I, I think um, groceries, supermarkets, they have all this partnership where you have a QR code that you just scan and use this Gcash to pay. Mm -hmm. So it's very efficient, especially during the pandemic. It has been a good opportunity for them that they came in right at the time of the pandemic. And that's why I think they have been growing ever since. I mean, I'm no part of Gcash, but I just watched how from, you know, I was one of, I think, not a few users in the past before the pandemic came in. I think it was just starting during 2019, something like that, if I'm not mistaken. And then eventually, during the pandemic, just like, boom. <laughs> Everyone yeah. has an account already. Wow, that's such a testimony of how a product at the right time that delivers a lot of added value to the customers exactly. generates this positive impact. Mm -hmm. I believe you're going to put that on your report for uh, the gender <laughs> inclusion and financial inclusion. Yeah, like one of the things in the Philippines, and I think they're quite aware as well because we were discussing it um, last week with my um, supervisor. It was just a random chat. That's cool. That's really cool. So, about the environment at Api, and we wish we can uh, show some more uh, landscapes from, uh, for the viewers yeah. here. How is uh, that place? Is only that institution or there are other institutions? Ah, okay. So, Api is basically a member-led institution. So, its members are the central banks of developing countries. So, that's why it's in Sasana Kijang, because one of its members, of course, Bank Nagara, and um, they're basically just based here for their main office, main head their headquarters. But they have offices in Luxembourg. Um, another one is in Japan. And I think there's going to be another one somewhere in Mexico soon. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be um, anytime this year or next year. But they said during their orientation that they're going to be having a satellite office in Mexico. So I think, yeah, um, the, but the issue is here in, in Southeast Asia. Before Malaysia, I think they were in Thailand um, when they started, if I'm not mistaken. And then they moved into Malaysia after you know, being established and I think having like the, um, everything institutionalized. Wow, that's really nice. Like, to know that uh, the efforts are not only in one region but in all different mm. regions is really cool. I remember there was something about the Global Findex that the AFI and the World Bank were building mm -hmm. and it was supposed to be done like every three years. Mm -hmm. But hearing you out, this sounds like a notch more interesting because like building from that narrative how the, the two products are actually different. If you happen to be male or if you happen to be female, how the world of financial inclusion works for you or how you beat the game and say, I'm a step ahead, I can make money, I can help people. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Now, as we discuss what is going on in the summer, which are your plans for uh, the fall semester? Um, I think, well, for the fall, I'd probably be, uh, well, I'm still thinking, but I, I'm quite close to about 80% planning to do a supply chain consultation. Um, and I wanted to get electives in the course of supply chain. Um, and then I'm also doing the international law elective this summer. Um, so that's an added one. And I think I'll be staying here until term five because I, I have some electives that I do want to do during term five, which are the services marketing. And I think there's a scenario planning that's also under the supply chain concentration. And of course, I'm very interested in that. Doing a side, um, I mean, before coming into ASP, I was working in a sideline as an HR recruitment associate for a company. Um, it's an IT company, it's called ShipServe, but it's basically um, in
in the maritime sector. So they have this platform where you do um, where buyers and um, sellers trade, and it's like a procurement platform where everything is there for the maritime industry. So it's very niche. And what I do is to recruit um, different people from London, particularly product designers, marketers, developers. So I put myself in a very, well, it's a combination of uncomfortable, but at the same time, I was finding growth. I never had an experience in recruitment. I wasn't sure that I was going to fit in an environment where it's rem purely remote work, but I was working for London, which is not the Philippines, totally different. And there's a lot of like diversity, and at the same time, the company is in IT, but it's very niche because like it's an Alibaba of the maritime industry. Mm -hmm. So that's basically how I summarize what they do. So it's like a software as service. So that's why platforms when Melody pitch became very interesting because I was like, I was always in the human resource side, but I wanted to understand more about how that company that I was part of was doing their business and platforms came like very interesting. So it's one of the things that I'm very excited about. I'm glad you mentioned this because I remember during uh, the early semester that uh, there was people from Sarawak visiting here mm -hmm. and they really showcased that one of their biggest issues is the modernization of their maritime office mm -hmm. and the ports everything. and it's like uh, uh, Michelle Sagan, mm -hmm. she is from Sarawak yeah. and she would love to hear like more options like from people that she knows right there in the Saragal government that hey, we can get our ports better mm -hmm. and uh, hearing you out I can see a connection happen <laughs> like hey it's, it's time to make money flow it's time to help people because it's always good to to make uh, to see people win mm -hmm. so we can see the real fabric of these people which is nice which is nice and I'm happy that uh, you're sharing that yeah so far uh, right now the, for the fall I'm thinking also to uh, continue with the series that I hope people are liking. Uh, hopefully, to get a, a, de uh, a deal to with the uh, Turkish Airlines to be the sponsor of the. Wow. I mean, I wish. I have to say, I wish because uh, the trip from Kuala Lumpur to to the Logan Airport in Boston it was six hundred dollars back and forth. So I'm happy for Turkish Airlines for that. <laughs> I hope if you're hearing this, please uh, let me know. Let's let's see how we can work this out. Partnerships is very much. Important. Exactly, partnership is the name of the game, and also focus on uh, what is the uh, scenario planning or to finish the data analytics, uh, mm. which is always uh, uh, fantastic to have. Like not only speak what you what you talk or what you feel, mm. that's right, but also <laughs> to uh, support it with the evidence. Supported with receipts. I'm that, very much curious actually about this that you do. I mean, technically, you're already a content creator, I, I must say. So, I'm sorry if I just jump in to ask you the question now, mm -hmm. but I wanted to understand what made you do this. Like, out of the blue, I mean, probably you thought about this. It doesn't come out like one day you just woke up and you wanted to shoot videos of people from different walks of life. So, I wanted to learn what's your perspective. How I came out with this series. Yes, and what's the inspiration behind? So, I wanted to document the experience, uh, but to only talking myself alone will be too boring. <laughs> That's right. Okay, and then I realized, wait a second. In this program, we have a lot of people from different backgrounds, each of them with different journeys, different dreams and aspirations. Talk to them. Just sit with them and hear about them. Now, how I came up with the format? And if we go back 13 years ago, uh, Joe Rogan mm -hmm. was uh, the original podcaster that was always just sitting, talking with someone else, and you hear more about the guest. It's like you want to learn from the guest. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty much uh, the, the whole thing. I wish I can have episodes of three hours, but uh, I understand that it's like a muscle you have to train. <laughs> Exactly. And uh, then I uh, wanted to also add a layer of uh, common questions that will speak uh, and also trying to get like uh, topics from each people. And that's uh, where Lex Friedman also enters, which is uh, how to talk with different people and from different backgrounds 
but also uh, what kind of lessons they can give us. And uh, well, Lex Freeman being a former MIT professor was also like you know, trying to circle back everything because when I'm visiting that place, it's like, oh, maybe that's how it's going to finally take shape of this. Some people will say, well, but where is the money? Where is the monetization? It's not about monetization at this stage, but because uh, first, just to document. Mm -hmm. We have so few time. By the time we are aware, time is gone. And it's like, then, then you have the other side of the coin, which is you reach some people and they don't want to do it because the concept is a little foreign for them. And it's like, how, how do you think I'm going to be talking, sitting and talking for one hour? Like, that kind of perspective is also uh, acceptable because people have things to do. So uh, in that regard, uh, just trying to uh, document the amount of information so new people can see and this, oh, that place is nice, yeah. or, ah, that topic, I want to learn more about it. Or it's like, oh, I exactly. did this is already providing an experience, you know. Uh -huh. And that's why I was saying you're already a content creator, because all of the contents are quite diverse, quite different. It's also inclusive because you do, I mean, you talk to women, men, all sorts of, like, walk of life from different perspectives about people, different industries. And what's really nice is, as you mentioned, this is a, like a muscle that you train yourself to like exercise. And it's not really perfect in the beginning. There has to be a constant practice or ways of improvement. It's similar to writing, like this one. Um, it takes time, you know, because I have been writing for most of my life. So that's what I've been doing. Um, for me, writing helps me also document stories. Um, it also, in a way, helps you to exercise a skill, which is listening. And not just listening, but active listening. Because at the end of the day, after each and every story that you, that you shoot or you film, um, you have to actually reflect, right? What you learn in the process and precise everything. And you would also have to edit, right? After you. So there's really a lot of like, you know, ways for you to improve and also learn from others. And that's why I, I had the question, because it's very interesting for me. And thank you so much for having me. Oh, yes, that's true. And then some people may say, how are you going to improve your product? Are you going to get better equipment, better microphones, or better guests? And it's like, hey, hey. it's not about the equipment. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of podcasts that are in Apple uh, or Spotify, they have no video. Mm -hmm. It's like different languages. To hire people or find people who wants to be volunteer like hey uh, I know Bahasa let me talk or translate your, your videos so I can reach more people or and the stories can go uh, a longer way or it's like I, I know I know these other languages let me just translate the, uh, the story and then you reach more people yeah it's very interesting you point that out because stories is really what binds people Aside from food, I'd say. <laughs> um, it's coming from different walks of life, different cultures, um, different nationalities. Stories from the very beginning, even our um, cavemen, our stonemen, the way that they had to do like all those images in the cave, it's also to tell a story. Because one day we'll be, you know, as you say, time is running out, you'll be out of this world, but your stories could actually live on. It's up to you if you want to leave a legacy, but it's also at the same time just through the stories that other, like, like a future generation probably learn something. Mm -hmm. That's true. And uh, now that you mentioned food, and we have been, we are adults, we look like adults, okay? <laughs> like, uh, some, which is your recipe for life? Ha! Okay. Um, well, of course, I'm a Filipino. And everybody says, if you're a Filipino, I don't know if you heard about it, we have this famous recipe called adobo. Mm -hmm. And I think it's been brought in the States and other areas across the world. But I'd say one of favorite food of mine, because I'm more of someone who likes soup. Um, there's this dish that we call in Filipino, sinigang. So it can you can use different kinds of meat. You can use fish, you can use um, basically pork, um, beef. Um, some people, I think even though if they're vegetarians, they don't put any meat, just all veggies. And it's quite a sour and spicy soup. And it has 
has different vegetables. You can put eggplant, you can put uh, lady fingers, you can put um, uh, taro crops, like the, the ones that are still white, not really the ones that are sweet already. And then there's also a variation where some people put guava, some people would put tamarind, basically. So there's different ways to cook it. Um, it's like noodles. <laughs> there's different approaches or ways. Whenever you go to different regions in the Philippines, you probably discover different ways on how to cook it. But the idea is it's a very sweet, uh, sorry, sour and spicy soup. Ah. And you can put meat on it, like chicken, beef, pork, or fish. Mm. That sounds really appetizing. Yes, and it's good for very rainy weather. That's why it's a. Um, a that's why Filipinos love it because during this time, around June to August, it's already rainy. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that for rainy weather, like food for rainy weather. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. And but of course, in the Philippines, it doesn't have to be just for rainy weather, but it's a staple in every home. But we just it like soup just helps you, especially this um, sour and spicy one. This helps you, especially in the rainy weather, when you just want to lay in bed and just be at home, right? That's cool. That's cool. Usually a recipe that I like to do on my own is like, uh, well, it's a function of the environment. Mm -hmm. But if you have the means, uh, try to cook your own brisket. Ah. The problem of the brisket is that it takes time. Uh, it takes time not only to do the slow cook, but also to get the specific cut of the meat. Mm -hmm. And some people may say, but that's not halal. And it's like, hey, you can get halal meat. Mm. There are no excuses on that. <laughs> Pork is a different animal, we know it. But <laughs> to get the specific cut of, of, the, of the cow and then to marinate it and do the slow cook mm -hmm. for 24 hours, and then you can do your in a grill to either with gas or with the coal or with the uh, lumber, it, it's a function also of what kind of flavor you want to add on based on the way you cook it. That's something. That's something that is valuable for me. Uh, it's because it's not about the plate itself, but how I make it a plate. It's a process. Exactly. And uh, that's when you have these elements to do this. Cooking is also an experience. Yes, it is. Yeah. And it's like uh, every morning when I cook my pancakes, <laughs> and it's like, I know how to do this. And I know the right size because that's how, how you know it's like that's how you make your own food. Yes. Because in the end, when you go to other places, it's like I'm not gonna be calling mommy. Like, I'm Asian <laughs> mommy. You know, you'll be an adult yeah. and, and do your own food, do your own meals. But actually, cooking is also um, a reminder of us about our family, about love from our moms. Because it's, I think it's a different love language. <laughs> like um, it's classified probably as one of the acts of service but I just remember whenever I learn or because I love cooking or baking as well I think I remember most of the time my mom my dad it's usually also my brother because it's just a way for us to bond as a whole and you, as you're correct the process of doing it sometimes it's not really about the product itself at the end of what, what you created but just recalling the steps and who you're with during that time. It's, mm -hmm. It creates this whole nostalgic and at the same time very um, refreshing feeling that helps me remember good times and good memories. That's true. And if we want to be a little controversial, like, oh, about dating, hey, we know that when you're cooking for someone, hey, it's an expression of love. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> maybe the food cannot be tasted okay, or maybe the ingredients were not the ones you were looking for, yeah. or maybe the presentation is not as part of, but hey, it's the act. Mm -hmm. it's the effort within. That's totally right. And I re we can also remember my grandma, for example, when she used to cook, when she was teaching us some, some small uh, little tricks. Uh -huh. hey, I saw that value too. So that's, that's something that people really value a lot. And appreciate in the long term that wishes to pass by to the next generation moving forward. Talking about generations, and there might be people that will be watching this in the future. Mm -hmm. There will be some young Elas watching <laughs> this. So, what piece of advice would you give to your younger self? To my younger self, 
if I was to give advice, is that the question? Uh -huh. I'd say probably, um, well, I'd say that the younger Ilya should basically always be grounded. To always have the heart and the ability to be critical about what's presented of her. I think I was fortunate enough to come from a very humble background. I mean, we, my family wasn't um, well off, but I never felt that way because um, I feel like my dad and my grandma and even my mom, they were very much pushing the love for education to us. We were always given books to read. Um, we were a simple family, but there's always something that I've learned. And I think they've already inculcated the value of always being, not thinking that you're the smartest in a room, and to be always open to opportunities. This is why I think I've been very much fortunate to have traveled, in, not just in Southeast Asia, but also in my home country, exploring all those 7,641 islands. Um, not everyone was fortunate to have that experience, and I took it in. And I think um, lastly is, of course, to be more um, aware of what she's capable of giving and what she cannot. Because there was a point in my life where I'd always just say yes. <laughs> Yes in most things, yes in a lot of opportunities, yes in a lot of people because I wanted to care, I wanted to please and that was really bad for, for my mental health, it spread me thinly and I think I don't want to make that same mistake if I would be to um, I mean, recall but I mean I think there was no regret at this stage because at the end of the day I made those choices consciously and it was part of who I was before. And I wouldn't have grown to understand what could I possibly give and what I do not have if I had, didn't actually went through that stage where I was saying yes to all those things. And it came to a point that people, if you're always a yes man, right, you tend to be going to be abused um, in some extent, taken advantage of. And I think that's probably what is wrong. So somehow, when I find my voice, my own voice, and true education, I say, that was where I know what I can possibly give and become more subtle in. This is like the boundaries I set in. This is what I can offer, and this is what I'm worth. I think I, I decided that I can talk to myself. That's a beautiful message because uh, when you say, to a younger person, it's like, hey, don't be a jazz man, a, a jazz sir. Stand your ground. You need to know what you are worth for and support the others that uh, have the same ideas. That's, that's powerful. That's really powerful. And especially now in this day and age, that uh, people will only want to find a small aha moment just to make you look weak. You cannot make you look. Uh, you cannot make weak when there is no weak at all. Yeah, exactly. Um, very true. Um, you can never control, I think, other people's um, actions towards you and what they do, but you can always control what your reaction is. It's like how the law of physics is as well, like the law of thermodynamics as well, in terms of your, how your energy should be used, right? Um, there's like a, this whole thing about, I think, both in my life, I put so much energy on some things and put much thinking on some things that shouldn't even have mattered that much. And that's why I, through the years, I learned that if it doesn't affect me in like five years time or like more than five hours, I don't devote myself to think too much about it. Just five minutes and I find my peace. Do you just happen to repeat the same line that uh, Ashman did? Oh. And we're gonna put right here somewhere <laughs> in that, uh, that part of the episode that he also say that thing. <laughs> So probably that's why Ash and me are quite close friends because I do learn a lot from him as well, work, like working with him in my AL project and also um, being with him as a friend. We're both overthinkers, we say that to ourselves, and our zodiac signs are the same. We're both Leos, but I think Ash, compared to me, um, I learned to him more to love myself and to stand on my ground because he's that kind of person, I'd say. Like, he always knows his value and his worth. 
this is why it's very refreshing to learn from him. And I think hopefully I impart something to him. That's, that's really beautiful. So, how can people find you? Uh, do you have any email, social media, a web page? Um, where, can they, where can they read your, uh, your writings? Oh, I used to blog, but I haven't been very active. Um, and I keep most of my writings to myself because most of my writings, I've worked as a ghostwriter for about more than five years of my life. And most of the writings I have, I always work in an organization where you have to sign and you have everything that you write will be their own property. Never really put my name on it. But I think the ones that I have is like my pieces. <laughs> but yeah, um, I'd probably be, I mean, I'm just in Instagram. My handle is, well, Midge Paris. Because my name is Maria Ida Green Paris. It's like Midge Paris. And yeah, I think that's it. I probably just would want to keep my writings to myself right now. I'm probably looking forward, I think in the future, to do something again to and probably be more brave enough to disclose the other things that I wrote in the past. So yeah. What a way to, to close the episode. Thanks for doing this. Thank you so much Fabian for having me. And uh, everybody who is right there, please stay safe and see you when I see you. Bye. Bye.